Welcome back. Well, we had a pretty exciting and informative um, first half of the program, and we um, anticipate an equally exciting and informative uh, second half of the panel that we have for us. Sherry Johnson is the Bill Services Director for Society for Human Resource Management based in Round Rock, Texas. She supports the states of Arkansas, Indiana, Louisiana, Michigan, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Texas. Sherry serves as Sherman's staff liaison to the Government Affairs Core Leadership Area for the Advocacy Team Initiative, and she is a member of the Sherm's Speakers Bureau. Sherry has worked in the HR profession for over 15 years with industry experience in not-for-profit community organizations, public education, and entrepreneurial experience as owner of a small business. Jane Metta founded MRR Medical Reimbursement Resource, LLC, in 1992 in Houston, Texas. For over 20 years, MRR has advocated for patients and their families to ensure that they receive all the benefits to which they are entitled under their insurance plans. MMR's clients include individuals with chronic illnesses, dual professional couples with children, seniors, and anyone frustrated with medical bills and insurance claims. Anyone frustrated, okay. <laughs> In addition, Jane consults with clients on benefit issues and insurance choices, including the search and selection of the most appropriate Medicare Part D drug plan for seniors, as well as the selection of Medicare supplemental plans. Sherry Young serves as the Executive Director for the Credit Coalition, a HUD-approved housing counseling agency whose membership includes Houston area financial institutions, community organizations, community leaders, and other related businesses and organizations. She is the Credit Coalition's lead instructor in foreclosure intervention, credit, home buyer, and reverse mortgage counselor. Aside from counseling and conducting Credit Coalition classes, Sherry participates in many community events to help spread the word about financial education, individual development accounts, free um, Vita site tax preparation assistance, and other programs that can help families build and retain their assets. She is the chair of the Counseling Committee of the Greater Houston Housing Coalition and co-chair of the Counseling Committee of the Texas foreclosure prevention task force. Each panelist will do a short presentation followed by a few questions from the panel. Please use your index cards if you have questions and um, write them down and we will collect them so that they may uh, be given to our panel. Please welcome our panelists. afternoon. I wanted to preface my comments with uh, the, the approach that I'm going to be taking with you this afternoon. You've heard a little bit already about the impact of the baby boomer retirees on the workforce and I'm going to speak to you primarily from that perspective for just a moment. So from the perspective of the employer. Now keep in mind as I'm sharing with you the information that I will be going through if you are representing yourself as an individual and you're wanting to arm yourself with information and data that will help you go back and have an effective conversation with your employer about what your goals are for your personal retirement, then hopefully that, that's my goal, that you will find some information in my presentation that will give you those talking points that you can go back and talk to your employer. And again, if you're in the room representing an employer, now I'm going to give you some information that is really going to help you um, prepare for the future for your workforce and the success of your organizations moving forward. Things that you should have on your radar and be preparing for. Now I've also brought with me 11 DVDs. 
So 11 individuals who registered for this event this afternoon are going to be lucky enough to take one of these home back with you. Um, or I guess we're going to mail them. We're going to draw the names and we're going to mail them to you. Um, what this is, is a 20 minute video. Uh, this highlights the National Institutes of Health. They are considered to be a preeminent, uh, a premier company that serves the needs of their older workers in, a, in an exceptional fashion. So they are, they are an extraordinary best practices case study um, compared to other companies on the best ways to work with, handle, engage, and retain older workers in the workplace. So this is, again, a great piece of information that will help you prepare for conversations with your employers back home. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I, what I want to start with is the up-and-coming baby boomer retirement is a challenge, a significant challenge that employers should be preparing for. Um, what you see before you on the screen is that some recent statistical research done by the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. And what you see reflected in here is that the U.S. workforce is aging at a very rapid rate, especially that age group of 55 to 64 years of age. Now you'll notice if you look just below that, a significant decrease in the number of employees, the number of workforce between the ages of 16 and 24. We see an increase in older workers, we see a decline in the number of new entrants into the workforce um, at, at this point in time. And that is moving forward into the next couple of decades, we will continue to see this pattern. Now, I want to share with you some more information about how many baby boomers do we really have in the United States. Well, the research indicates we have about 77 million baby boomers. The first group of those baby boomers who reached the average age, the traditional retirement age, which is 65 years old, that first group of baby boomers started reaching that age in 2011. So again, in 2011, we had the first baby boomers starting to reach what we consider to be the average retirement age. According to the Pew Research Center, 10,000 more baby boomers reach the age of 65 every day. And they will continue 10,000 a day, every day for the next two decades, reaching the age of 65. Now, there's good news for employers to keep, on, keep in mind because of the recession, since about 2008, 2009, we have seen a trend that the number of baby boomers have decided to postpone their retirement and stay in the workforce a little longer because financially they had to. No other option. But now as, as the recession is starting to improve, we've seen the GDP is starting to go up. We've seen the unemployment rate starting to come down after some pretty dismal years. And with that, it's bringing an increased level of consumer confidence and uh, just there, there's more trust in the economy at this point than there has been over the last few years. And for that reason, many baby boomers who had postponed retirement are now considering moving forward with those retirement goals. We've been doing a lot of research, and, and you can see I'm not going to go through all the data here. Um, you can read that as I'm speaking. Uh, but you can see that many of the baby boomers have already started to retire. Some of them are fully retired. Some are partially retired. There's a lot of different things that baby boomers are starting to do right now as they're entering into those retirement goals. Now, there's a problem within the United States, and that is that, as I've already represented to you, the number of new entrants in the workforce will not sufficiently cover the vacancies left by the baby boomers when they leave the workplace. We call this brain drain on an organization. What's going to happen when those 77 million baby boomers leave the workforce? It's going to leave significant skills gaps and talent shortages. It, it's going to mean that the employers are not capable of getting the same level of productivity from the workforce left behind that they are currently accustomed to and, and achieving within their strategic goals for the organizations. Does that make sense to everybody? So they're going to be dependent upon the new entrants coming into the workforce. But as I mentioned, there's a decrease in that number, right? There's not as many of them. In fact, 
what you can see on the screen, there's only going to be about 20, the employers are going to need about 23 million people, but there are more than 23 million people, but that's all the graduates that will be coming out of our colleges and universities during the next 10 years. So again, it's, there's not going to be enough new entrants in the workforce to fill the gaps that are going to be left behind. When the baby boomers leave, they take that institutional knowledge, the skill and the talent that they've earned or gained on the work, play, in the workplace for their employers, that all goes with them. Now, what we're finding too, that the United States compared with all other nations, educationally, we are lacking. So there's, there's an organization called OECD that stands for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And they do a survey, they do research, they study students age 15 um, around the globe, and they compare the ability of those students uh, in the areas of math, reading, and science to see if they can apply what they're learning in the classroom effectively on the job. They put that program together, that study together is the PISA, which is the Program for International Student Assessment. This study is done every three years. The data I have on the screen for you is from 2009 study. I do not have the 2012 study results on the screen, but what my understanding is that it, the, the results are comparable, in fact, maybe even a little less successful for the United States as compared to 2009. So again, about 470,000 students participated in that study. And what we found is there's a significant um, lack in the ability of U.S. students as compared to other students from nations around the globe. Especially, this is creating competition between uh, the United States and those other emerging countries, specifically China and India. So we'll talk about that just a little bit. China is, is um, quickly surpassing the United States economically. Um, they, they are very highly educated. They, they are expected, they are anticipated by the year 2020 that they could be this, the world's second largest economy. And so that should give us great concern, considering the information that I've just shared with you, that we were losing talent from our, from our workplaces. We don't have the, the skilled, educated students, the new entrants into the workforce, and that's going to put a, a, a significant drain, strain, on the U.S. economy moving forward into the next couple of decades and beyond. Um, AARP and SHRM are partners. We've entered into a multi-year partnership to study the impact of baby boomer retirements on the U.S. workforce. And what is that going to look like? And more importantly, are businesses, are organizations, large and small, prepared for the impact of the baby boomer retirement? Um, as a result of our partnership, Sharm conducted a survey, and AARP, gratefully, thank you, um, AARP co-sponsored that survey, and it was conducted in 2012, and the research has continued since then. And as a result of the research, a toolkit has been developed, which is available on the Sharm website, to help employers with this challenge. Now, what it, there's some, some um, specific points of data as a result of that study that I want to share with you right now. There were about 470 responses or organizations represented in this particular study. Seven out of ten out of the organizations that responded to the survey indicated that they know for a fact that the up-and-coming baby boomer retirements will have a significant and adverse impact on the success of their organizations moving forward. Now here's a scary number. Only 29% of those organizations have done anything about it. 29% said that they had conducted a strategic workforce analysis to determine exactly what that impact is going to be on their organizations. Now about 45% of the companies responded said that they have started to put some sort of programs or initiatives in place to address this challenge, but many of the organizations know that they are not prepared to move forward. 
That concludes my specific points for you right now. There's my contact information. Um, I'm sure that during the questions, we'll, I, I'm, I'm hoping to get to you uh, this afternoon some specific strategies that employers can put into place to address this challenge and those talking points that you as an employee in an organization can take back to your employer to work on those retirement goals for yourself as, as individuals. Thank you very much for your time. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. Super. Um, with all us boomers here, and with all us boomers who've been paying for years for Medicare, that's what I'm going to talk to you about this afternoon. Um, Medicare is federal health insurance for people who are over 65 or folks who are under 65 and who are disabled. And the only people today who are automatically enrolled in Medicare are those folks who are taking Social Security benefits early or those folks who um, are disabled and are the swoops. who are, um, are those folks who um, are disabled and are receiving disability benefits. So how do you do it? Well, you call or you, uh, or you go online. It is the job of Social Security to enroll all of us in Medicare. You can call Social Security at 1-800-772-1213, 1-800-772-1213, or you can go to ssa.gov and you can enroll. If you're working past 65, you'll have to call them. You cannot enroll online because they have a couple documents that they ask for you to complete. One thing I'd like to caution you about is try to allow about six weeks from the time that you initiate this process until you're planning on starting Medicare because it takes them a while. Don't be like my walking partner who waited for the day before. I mean, you know, we walked together for years, didn't I? And I lectured her and, you know, what can I tell you? <laughs> there are two special enrollment periods, and they just about cover all of us. The first uh, special enrollment period is for folks who are going on Medicare when they turn 65. That is a seven-month enrollment period, the three months before your 65th, excuse me, 65th birthday, your birthday month, and the three months after your 65th birthday. And most people really shoot to go on, on uh, the month of their 65th birthday. And you always go on Medicare on the first of the month. Now, if you happen to wait past your 65th birthday and you enroll a month or two afterwards, you would just go on the following month. But a lot of us, as Sherry was saying, are working past 65, aren't we? Now, those of us who are self-employed, like myself, when I turned 65, um, I obviously went on Medicare because I didn't have a group plan. But many people continue to work and they have a group plan. And if you have a group plan and you turn 65, your company must continue to insure you, to provide you with insurance. But what the government says to small companies, and that is a company with less than 20 employees, the government says to that company, we're going to give you a break. Yes, you've got to continue to provide that insurance, but your employee who's over 65 can carry Medicare as primary insurance. Now, the company does not have to do that. The company may like you and say, I'm going to continue to pay for this insurance just the same as before you turn 65. But that is the option of that smaller company. If you're working for a larger company of 20 or more employees, most folks will carry that group plan uh, as primary. Uh, you don't have to. You can always carry Medicare. But most of, uh, most of our clients, most of the people we see that continue to work past 65, they have a large company, and that is their primary health insurance. I will caution you, 
if you decide to carry Medicare along with your primary group plan. Medicare will be secondary, and Medicare rarely pays many benefits as secondary coverage. And you're going to be paying a premium with, the part, with part B of Medicare. And most people will wait to pick up part B until they retire because you're going to be paying a premium for secondary coverage that rarely will pay benefits. You're going to have your large group plan as primary. So just keep that in the back of your mind. There are some people that uh, may not be working or they may be working and they're insured through a spouse's group plan. Same, uh, same rules and regulations apply. Uh, if you're uh, insured through your husband's group plan, you can carry it as long as he's working. When he stops working, then you must go on Medicare if you're over 65. And that's the second enrollment period, a special enrollment period for those of us who are working past 65 and who have a group plan. An individual continues to work past 65 and is insured on the company plan or your spouse's plan. And when you stop working, you, you could retire, you could just stop. Uh, you could quit. Uh, you have an eight-month special enrollment period during which you can enroll in Medicare. Now, just about everybody I know goes on Medicare as soon as they can because they want to have continual coverage. Does that make sense to everybody? I'd like to say one thing about COBRA. You know, we have COBRA, and there are certain times that you will use COBRA when you stop working to continue your insurance coverage. COBRA and Medicare do not work together. When it's time to go on Medicare, it is not time to use COBRA. If you are retiring from your group plan and you opt to go on COBRA, there is no special enrollment period for Medicare after COBRA ends. It is not postponed until you finish your COBRA. Simultaneously, while you are on COBRA, you are running through your enrollment period. Whether you're at 65 or you work past 65 till you're 70. What does that mean? Well, it means that you don't have a, a period during which you can enroll in Medicare. So what do you do? Well, you're left with the annual enrollment period. And let's just say that you retired and you could have gone on Medicare and you opted to carry COBRA for 18 months, and your COBRA ended in December. So you can enroll in Medicare sometime in the first quarter of the next year, but your Medicare will not start until July 1. So you will not have any insurance for six months. In addition, because you did not go on Medicare when you should have, the government is going to attach a penalty to your Part B premium and it's 10% of your Part B premium for every 12 months that you should have been in Medicare and you weren't. So in my example of 18 months, they've gone into the second 12 month period, that person will not only be without Medicare coverage for six months, that person will have a 20% penalty uh, of their Part B premium, monthly premium forever. I'm not trying to scare you. What I'm trying to impress upon you is think very carefully when you retire from your group plan or you turn 65 and it's time to go on, on Medicare, think very carefully about carrying COBRA. And companies are not required to inform you about this. I have a client and she asked me to share her story with everyone. She was an attorney for Exxon. And she worked until she was about 67 and then she carried uh, COVID for 18 months and then she called me and said I'd like to go on Medicare. It was August. I said you can't go on Medicare until next July. And she had serious health problems. And when she went on Medicare she has a 20% uh, penalty of her Part B premium forever. So just kind of put that little COBRA memo in the back of your mind when you're thinking about going on Medicare. When you go on Medicare, you have choices. You have two choices for medical coverage. 
Traditional Medicare is called A and B, and you can see Part A covers inpatient, hospital, skilled nursing, and hospice. Part B covers all your outpatient care, and they tag team together. If you have one, you have the other, and then you have full uh, medical coverage. And the dollar signs indicate premiums. That's why they're in red. And if you're carrying A and B, we recommend that you do carry a freestanding Medicare Part D drug plan. They're offered by lots of companies like ARC. My husband's on ARC. It works really well. Um, there are 34 in the state of Texas. And you can go online to Medicare.gov, and you can put your information in, and you can put your prescription drugs in, and they will list the 34 plans that um, are most economical, down to the most expensive. What we do caution you to do is to read past through the pages that they have there, and it, it can be complicated, and look and make sure that it's a user-friendly plan. We do this for a lot of clients, and we want to make sure that you have the most economical plan that works for you, but also one where you're not going to the pharmacy and being hassled about a drug that you need to take because your plan doesn't want to pay for it. 34 plans in Texas this year. And then we recommend that you take a private, carry a private supplemental plan uh, which is your catastrophic safety net that goes along with parts A and B and it picks up deductibles and it covers all copays. And the supplemental plans are private insurance that have been standardized by the government. So that's one of your choices. And your second choice is the new kit on the block. It came on, out under the Bush administration. It's called the Advantage Plan and it's part C. And uh, part C, you see there's just one dollar sign there. That's one of the real advantages of the Advantage plans. You only have one premium, and it happens to be the same premium as Part B. We call it the Part B premiums. I'm going to show those to you uh, at, right before I close. Um, the Advantage plans replace A, B, and the supplemental. And you would want to be on an Advantage plan that has a, a drug plan incorporated in it. But you can see just one premium as versus three premiums, and essentially the benefits are the same. Why would anybody with a brain go on Medicare A and B, D and a supplemental plan and spend all that money if they can go on an Advantage plan and save money on premiums? With A and B, you do get a larger choice of providers than you do with C. There are lots of great Advantage plans, and you all have heard them, you'll see them on TV right now. Um, AARP has them, Secure Horizon, Texan Plus, Kelsey Siebel, our big local clinic. They all have Advantage plans. But what you want to ensure before you go on an Advantage plan or your loved one goes on it is that your doctors and hospitals are in that plan. You just want to be sure about that. And open enrollment is 10-15 through 12-7 with changes going into effect on January 1. And that's when you can switch from A and B to C or vice versa. They don't care. They don't care what your pre-existing conditions are. And it's also when you can look at your Part D drug plan and ensure that it's going to work for you for the next year. Because there are two variables on these Part D drug plans. Your drugs can change from year to year when you've done your search the year before. And the plans do change. Most of the plans do change. So you just want to make sure that your plan for 2014 is going to work for 15, and that's during the period when you do that. Um, this is actually some information on Part B, and uh, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm just going to go down to the um, premiums here at the bottom part of the page. The left column is your <coughs> monthly individual Part B premium. We all go on Medicare as individuals. And what Medicare started um, after 2000, actually under President Bush, is that they have five different levels of Part B premium depending upon your income. And if you file as a single, that's the income breakdown. And if you file as a married couple, that is the married couple breakdown. It's just double. And these are the premiums. And they have not gone up since last year. They're the same as last year. And, and so if you were ever curious about if they could uh, exchange information about you, yes. 
the IRS, Social Security, and Medicare are able to exchange information about you, and Medicare is able to get your tax return. And they will look at your last tax return, which means then they will look at your income from the year before. And if your income changes from year to year, your premiums will change from year to year. And what they look at is they look at your modified adjusted gross. That is your adjusted gross. You all are all familiar if you've ever signed a tax return with your adjusted gross. Modified adjusted gross, they add in any tax-free interest income. And that is an example of that would be a municipal bond. So I'm going to um, end with that. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to stay after the program is over and um, answer any questions you have. provider, I talk to Anna, reverse mortgage counselor, I speak to people from all walks of life and usually it is when they're in their down period, um, either a, a loved one has passed, they've lost their income, they're got 52 years of marriage and now they're divorcing and because one of them doesn't like each other anymore. Or, or they um, have just had that notice at work that their job, they aren't working for one of those employers who actually care about their uh, the benefits they're carrying with their company or the company's been downsizing or for whatever reason they're out of work. And so my place today is to have everyone in here think about, not think about that you're going to have a hardship come your way, but what would you do before that hardship comes, that financial hardship? How could you prepare for it so you aren't um, calling a head of your housing counseling agency in desperation saying, what do I do? So first thing, we, what we ask everyone that come through our classes and that I speak to one-on-one -on -one is, we ask, where does your money go right now? If you're going to be trying to prepare for a potential hiccup in your life or a, a financial problem, do you know what it takes to maintain your lifestyle today? You may not be in such a bad shape. If you don't truly know where your money's going, how do you know you're going to have a problem in the future? So we ask everyone to write down every single penny you spend for at least 30 days. The good news is tomorrow is the first, right? So everybody in here, if I saw you in 30 days, I'd ask you how that tracking go. So I ask you to write down everything you spend for the next 30 days, every penny, from money that you give to your grown children, money if you give to people in the corner, um, you put money in a machine down the hall, wherever you spend your dollars, we want you to know what that is. But we also ask you to save your receipts. The receipt saving, people say, well, you know, I, I don't need my receipts, I use my debit card. What is the purpose of a receipt? Can someone share with me what you think the purpose of a receipt is? Balance your checkbook. You balance your checkbook. Uh, see what you actually bought. You can see what you actually bought, yes. It could be for tax purposes. Not how much you paid for each item. You, it separates out what you purchased, what you paid. Yes, ma'am? Proof of purchase. Proof of purchase. I'll throw one more. I heard return and discrepancy. Yeah, you have your receipt. Well, there's one more thing. Each receipt, did you were you um, purchasing that item from the, the, the couch that you're at your house or your comfy bed? Were you laying there when you went to buy that item? How did you buy that item? You went to the store, right? Some of us do buy online. But if you went to the store, what does that take? Yeah. Takes gas. 
What else? It takes time. It's your time. If at the end of this month, when you pull out all these receipts and you separate them out in categories, how many times did you go to Walmart? How many times did you go to Target? Who shops at H-E-B? How about Kroger? Where do you shop? And look at your shopping patterns. If you could eliminate one trip in a week to one of those stores, still buy what you normally buy, you might be able to free up at least an hour. What could you do in that hour? Or longer, if you're like me, and you go to the store and just ramble aimlessly through the hours. Um, what could you do in, with an hour of your time? If you had an extra hour in a week, what could you do? Think about that. You don't have to tell me. Apparently, nobody wants to share. But uh, maybe take a hot bath, read that book, um, watch this video that you're going to win here, this 20-minute 20, 20 video. You could do something fun for yourself. Take a walk. Something that gives you pleasure instead of going to that store. We want you to know where your money goes. If you're honest with yourself, this could be a real eye-opening exercise for yourself because you may find that, that what you thought you were spending, living paycheck to paycheck, or not able to set aside anything in savings, you may find now, wow, I could squeeze out an extra $25 this week. I didn't even realize it. Who in here goes to the grocery store and the first thing you do, you grab a basket? Anybody do that? Grab a basket? Okay. My homework to you guys is this. Instead of grabbing that basket for those run, quick run in the store and grab trips, you know, like getting milk or bread or something, a snack for dinner tonight or a snack after dinner, go in with just your hands. Go into the store. I know. I heard it. Uh. <laughs> now, now, in some cases, you might like using that basket to, to help you walk through the aisles, and I can understand that, too. You might need it to help prop you up. But then in that case, get one of those little bitty smaller baskets. These are the great big baskets. But try not to grab a basket and go in and buy what you were going to buy with just your hands. Now, you stop at the checkout counter. Don't walk out. Uh, but you, you pay with, you pay, you buy what was in your hands and you leave. That could keep you from spending an extra 20, 30, heck even 100 bucks that you weren't intending on spending on that trip to the store. Again, now you can set aside, we talked about how you save earlier, the question was, how can we start saving? There you go, pay yourself first, that's what she said, pay yourself first. Review your credit reports. Who in here has seen their personal credit reports in the last 12 months? Oh, good. I hope you've seen all three. You know, the federal law allows all of us to see our personal credit reports for free every 12 months. Many people think I don't need to see it because, you know, I know I have good credit. How do you know someone else is, use, is not using your good name? If you're going to need to reestablish credit after a hardship or establish credit for the first time after a hardship, your creditors are going to be looking at those credit reports to determine what um, what kind of person you've been in your past life. Um, we want you to create a debt worksheet and let you know who you owe and what terms. Some of you in here may have a car note right now, but you may not have a clue on what you're paying for interest. If you go and you pull out your contract, you may have thought you were getting that 1.9%, but maybe you signed for a 5.9 or 7.9% rate. Maybe you thought you were getting a three-year term, but in reality you signed for a five-year. The payment is very affordable. We ask everyone to get a copy, read those contracts, and if you find that you are in a term that you're not comfortable with, or you could do better, interest rates are very really low, go to your bank or credit union. Go where you have a relationship with it. Ask them about refinancing. Maybe it'll free some money up. Do not close any existing accounts. If you're thinking right now, I know this hardship's coming, I just need to close all my credit card accounts. You know, once you close those, it's going to be hard to open back up if you need them in the future. Put them in a Ziploc bag. Get that credit card. Stick it in a Ziploc bag, a freezer bag, a gallon bag. Fill it with water. Stick it in the freezer. It'll be safe there for you when you're ready to use it again. It's like Thanksgiving turkey. You buy it the night before, what do we have to do? You stick it in the bath, doesn't let it defrost, right? Let the water run on it. You can do the same with your, your car, but it may keep you from making a purchase you didn't really want to make, although you could return it because you have your receipts. But again, if you are needing to use that credit in the future, you don't want to close it. Um, know your assets. What do you own? 
could you possibly, if you're coming up with, you're thinking, okay, this financial disaster is happening to me, or I'm having this hardship, what can you sell? What do you have that you own free and clear? Your home, could you take, uh, could you sell your home? Would you need to downsize? The market right now, they say it's great for the sellers, they're selling quick, but what would it cost you to replace that home? Would it be more economic, economical for you to stay there, or would it be more economical for you to sell and then rent? But before you become a renter, check out to see what are the rents going for in the community you want to live in. Um, if employed, okay, this is where I was going to talk about COBRA, but I'm not going there now. Um, <laughs> if you're employed and, you're, and you are right now employed, but you're looking at the possibility of being downsized, but you're not 65 yet or approaching 65, um, I learned that today, thank you. Um, do you have COBRA benefits? What other benefits do you have? Many employers have employee assistance funds that will help you either locate new employment or help you find services that may may help you in the short term, possibly in the long term. Um, can you bring in extra dollars by building an emergency save, or do you have an emergency savings? We just learned that one out of three of us, and I'm in that bracket, we do not have more than $5,000 in savings. I feel very good that I'm not alone, but I've lived a long life, and I've spent a lot of money, and I've taken care, I've had a good time doing it. But now I'm also looking at the future. Where am I going to get this money from? I'm going to be following these tips. Um, so hobbies, can you declutter and sell? Again, uh, part-time employment. Beware of scams. If anybody's trying to tell you they can help you quickly for a fee, run. Run the other way. There is nothing these companies can do for money that you can't do for yourself for free. If it sounds too good to be true, it most likely is not good for you. We see on KHOU, right? Is that right, right? Well, we, that's see, right. Exactly. <laughs> we see on many of the TV stations, especially China, um, that there are so many scams out there. They're targeting our elderly population, but not just the elderly. They're ta tackling, they're attacking all of us. And if you did not live in Canada, how do you win the Canadian lottery? If you don't have family members in Nigeria or Afghanistan or Timbuktu, you, you're not a prince of that country. So, you know, if you don't fall victim for these scams, make a plan, get your whole household involved in it, ask your household members. Some of us are single wage earner households, some of us are just single households. We don't, we maybe go to our dog and our cat and ask us, okay, what can we do here? Can I change from benefit to something else? Um, but understand that your household that you live with, you share your information with, ask them to buy in on this reduction if a reduction is necessary. And last but not least, seek help from the free sources that are out there. 211, our United Way helpline, no matter which community you live in, United Way has a helpline that you can dial from your home phone and your cell phone. You tell them what you're, you tell them your cousin is going through this problem. My sister has this problem. Maybe you're talking about yourself. They'll provide the information and the resources for you. United Way also um, has online a job. Uh, they, our local United Way of Greater Houston has a job resource center where you don't have to um, sign up for it. You just go in and look at the job connection board. They have jobs listed last 90 days with local nonprofits, and some of them list their salaries. And reach out to the head of your housing counseling agencies. We are here to help you for free. Yes, ma'am. Can you miss one thing? Can you go back? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, contact your creditors. If you are in a situation where you think you may be missing a payment, you haven't missed yet, it is very important to call that mortgage company, call those credit card companies, and let them know that you are potentially going to have this issue. You want to place it in the notes. Let them know that this issue might be happening. This time I'm still making my payment, but it was just going to let you know that I'm getting ready to lose my job. Is there anything that the company can do to help me through this crisis. 
They may be willing to give you a forbearance period, a time off, one or two months of no payments, but understand this, they may still report it as late to the credit bureaus, but a late on the credit bureau is, is something <coughs> minor compared to being able to feed yourself, feed your family, and take care of yourself. Um, so again, it's very important. Open up that line of communication. Always write down date, time, and who you talk to, and what the conversation said, what you said both sides. Keep notes. I would suggest, instead of just taking notes, get a notebook. And you make by the date, I called this one, I called that one, I called this one, and that one. This is who I spoke to, this is what they said. Now, will they always be in agreement to assist? Not the first time. Pick up the phone and call the second time. You might have to call the third time. Ask for a supervisor. Again, they're there, they want to get paid, and you want to pay them. But maybe at this time you're just having an issue and you just need some help. Needs a little bit of time off. Last, thank you. Um, here's my information. Um, if you need us outside of this, we'd be glad to answer any questions. Let me just tell you, I'm an agency with one staff myself. People get voicemail, email me. We, uh, we're here, all of us are here to answer your questions. And again, thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm over my time. Thank you. Well. These are the experts we were talking about earlier who can really help you address questions um, directly. So this is your opportunity now while we're gathering some questions. Um, maybe we'll ask a couple here first. Uh, well, let's, I know Jane went over this a little bit earlier, but uh, if I'm going to be 65, still working, and have health insurance, do I need to sign up for Medicare? You want to use the microphone, Jane? Hello? Okay. Um, if you are still working, your company must continue to insure you just as he, the company insured you before you turned 65. So you do have that insurance plan. But remember I said that the government differentiates between large and small companies. They give a break to those small companies of less than 20 employees. And those companies do not have to insure you as primary. That means that you would sign up for Medicare and carry Medicare as your primary insurance and carry the company plan as secondary. I also said, you know, you may have worked there a while, they may like you a lot, and they may say, oh no, you don't have to sign up for Medicare. We will continue to insure you as primary. That's the small company. There's flexibility there, but it is up to the company. And that means communication between you and your boss, right? To find out. And, and then you'll find out if you need to actually sign up for Medicare and carry it as primary. For those companies of 20 or more employees, your group plan will be your primary insurance. You do not need Medicare. You can just carry your group plan and continue to be insured by your group plan until you leave or retire or whatever. And that would also apply to if you're insured through a spouse who has a who is working and has a group plan. Okay, now we've got sorry. <laughs> we have some of the questions from the audience, so let's go ahead and take this. Um, for Sherry Young, would you really advise seniors uh, to do the reverse mortgage? Uh, P.S. Full disclosure: I am a tax real estate broker. <laughs> all right. First of all, as a reverse mortgage counselor, it is not my place or any of our places to talk anyone in or out of any loan product. Our place is to make sure folks understand the good, the bad, the pretty, and the ugly about the reverse mortgage product as well as other alternatives that may be available to them that may not be as costly. We do not advise, we provide only information. 
So the answer is, we do not advise. <laughs> we, we only provide information. And just say HUD is very clear that their counselors must pass certification exams. We have to meet a standard. And I'm just um, really glad that HUD has, has seen that. Sometimes we see people that don't quite believe that um, our place is to only provide information, um, but you know that's that's the rule, and we just provide information. Okay, um, this one I think probably is going to be for Sherry. Um, if there, uh, how much can you earn? Uh, how much can you earn? What? Sorry, I heard you. Uh, while working, how much can you earn while working? and while drawing Social Security. <laughs> so you can't, I'm sorry, they wrote Sherry here. Say that again. How much can you earn while working while drawing Social Security? Am I misunderstanding this question? Okay. Okay, I think um, that maybe uh, that was mentioned a little bit earlier. So the website has a calculator for doing that. Okay. Uh, I am almost 65 within the enrollment period. I work part time. My younger husband, ooh, we a <laughs> is covered by a large group plan. Any penalties for waiting to do Medicaid B, D, or C? I guess that must be Jane. Medicare. Sorry, Medicare. Medicare. Right. And that may be my. Everybody mine. gets those confused. That's why I'm um, sorry. No, there are no penalties. And you know, when I have more time to talk, I always like to pick out uh, someone in the audience who has a younger spouse who still is working, and that person is turning 65, and the 65 year old is insured through the younger spouse. We love it if it's a younger husband. <laughs> uh, and as long as um, your spouse is working, uh, you uh, can carry uh, to be insured by that group plan. You don't have to fool with Medicare at all. You will not be penalized. All right. So cougars, keep working. <laughs> there you go. What kind of retirement investments do you suggest for someone who is just beginning to save for retirement, stock funds, bond funds, or annuity? Okay, I think we're going to have to take a pass on this one. Is that all right? Okay, let's see what else do we have here. All right, uh, for AARP, are you working to limit companies from reneging on retirement promises? Are you working to place the onus of correcting credit reports on the reporting agencies? Anybody from AERP? Junior? That's true. Do you want to take that one? Are you the first question again. Are you working to limit companies from reneging on retirement promises and are you working to place the onus of correcting credit reports on the reporting agents? Yes. So, so um, the fact is that we do have, we you know, we, we, um, we do have a lot of work that we do in um, different states. Uh, it is, frankly, we have we have a litigation unit at ARP that does public interest litigation. But in many instances, uh, there is no legal basis uh, for stopping the company. So if there is no legal basis, then then you're kind of stuck. It, we, we do work on, particularly on public employee pensions where there, is, uh, uh, there are efforts to reduce them. We, we work with, uh, we work with the, the uh, entity that, that creates the pension. We try to make things the best we can for our members and for people who have these pensions. But in many instances, you, know, there, you are in a situation, particularly for those who are not yet retired, where there is no um, legal basis to keep something that 
that you thought you might get. Okay. And on the second question, I, you know, I, it's not, yeah, it's not something, it, it is not something that I'm aware that we work on. Um, I have a question for Sherry Johnson. Um, AARP has said that it believes older workers will change the American workplace on a level comparable to the change that women workers have had on the past couple of decades as their ranks grew. Um, do you think that's accurate? And what can both employers do to attract and retain older workers? And what can older workers do to stay active and engaged to make themselves valuable? I mean, you spoke about that huge gap, 7 million people. So. Well, thank you for the question. Um, yes, I do think that over the next two decades, as I mentioned a moment ago, the number of baby boomers who will be leaving the workforce will have a significant impact on the workforce and on the economy here in the United States, just as um, the, the women in the workplace have had over the years. Um, there are some strategies that, that employers can put into place to attract and retain older workers in the workplace. Um, one of them would be workplace flexibility. That would be the first one that I would want to highlight for you. This, uh, you may have heard the term before, work-life balance. Well, the trend is really shifting. You'll notice the experts in the field have stopped saying work-life balance, and they've started to shift that more toward work-life fit. Realistically, there's never going to be a balance. It's more about making life and work fit together in a way that are conducive for the family uh, and being able to continue to work. We heard a moment ago about the sandwich generation. Those are the individuals who are currently caregivers for both young children as well as providing care to their elder loved ones. Uh, and, and the baby boomers find themselves in that situation more and more. A good workplace flexibility program will allow that employer to retain that talent within the organization so that the older worker is not forced to leave in order to provide that care to their loved one, younger or older. It also allows the older worker to continue to work in the workplace, reducing the level of stress. You see, one of the things that the statistics show, the research has indicated, is older workers are actually healthier and happier and more productive than younger workers in the workplace. And so if you can keep them in there, um, you're benefiting them and their families as well as the organization. Something else tied to that is there's been a question about do older workers cost more for the employers in terms of health care insurance? Well, actually the research indicates that older workers can be less costly to the employer for insurance and things. Typically, the most costly age group within a workforce is that group that are between like 30 to 45 or, or 50 years of age, and that's because of children and, and the other health-related medical needs. Older workers who stay in the workforce are inactive and become healthier. And so if you can continue to work, your health will benefit from that. And some other strategies for the, for the uh, employers. Alternative work arrangements, job sharing, job shadowing, internships, mentorships, phased retirement. Now you need to look at things uh, related to the Pension Protection Act of 2006, has some legal implications um, that you might want to consider if you're thinking about a phased retirement program. Uh, but that is a strong way to keep the older workers in the workplace longer. And if you are considering retiring, and you've not had those conversations with your employer, it behooves you to go to them and say, what options do I have? Can I go into partial retirement, gradually get into full-time retirement? Can I come back on a part-time temporary basis after retirement? What are my options? And the employer may not have thought about it. So it, it, it's helpful for you to start the conversation. Um, health and wellness opportunities and other um, training and development programs, maybe it's a shift of career. So the older worker actually starts, um, we heard about it, what's my something new? What's something new that you can continue to do for the current employer, but in a less stressful capacity or a less full-time capacity? So those are some ideas. Um, thank you. Uh, and I think we're about out of time. I, I'm going to take one second. How many people here Facebook? Anybody? 
Oh, yay. Anybody Twitter? Oh, <laughs> this is a blatant, shameless plug as I try to, you know, keep up with the young kids at my office. Um, I'm going to just ask you if you would like me, please, on Facebook, K-H-O-U Sherman, or Twitter, K Sherman K-H-O-U. Because, uh, yes, I'm trying to retool myself, you know, as a more mature worker, uh, and we, uh, we get report cards on social media, like how many people, you know, we have followers and likes and all that, and um, I... And not doing very well in this department. <laughs> I'm laughing behind the kids. So, oh, I see a hand. Uh, oh, this is, I mean, I guess after you finish, um, somebody had the question on Barnes and Wright case, which they um, mm -hmm. asked about the financial You see more resources right here and now. Just walk up those steps. All right, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen.